So welcome everybody. We're so excited that you're with us today. Um, and we are gonna begin in just a moment. So thank you for your patience. Okay. So good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Disrupting Islamophobia and Intersecting Oppressions in K-12 Schooling. My name is Dr. Vidya Shah and I'm an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at York University. And co-moderating with me this afternoon is Saima Chowdhury. Hello, my name is Simon Chowdhury. I am a seconded faculty member at the Faculty of Education at York University, as well as an OCT educator. And my uh, home board is Peel District School Board. So today's session will be recorded. And to support with bandwidth, we kindly ask that you keep your videos and mics turned off throughout the webinar. As the webinar proceeds today, if you have any questions, you, you can use the chat feature to direct any questions to me. And if you have a question that you're posing for the panel, if you can kindly uh, write your question in all caps so that when it's time for the Q&A at the end of the session, we can be sure to find your questions easily. As well, if you are planning to use social media today to share any of your learning or to archive your thinking, we kindly ask that you use the hashtag, hashtag CFR Islamophobia series. And I'm just gonna ask Saima if she can just put that into the chat for folks so they can see what the hashtag is. We are really excited about how quickly this webinar filled up. Uh, within days, we were at our capacity. And um, as exciting as that is, it also speaks to the need for these kinds of conversations to be happening more regularly. And so we welcome you here today. We thank you for being part of this conversation. And we look forward to many more of, of such conversations. Despite a diversity of histories and realities, uh, the dominant discourses of Muslims and Islam in Canada are presented as monoliths that are steeped in deficit beliefs and racist xenophobic thought. This webinar explores Muslim students and families experiences of Islamophobia and ex intersecting oppressions, including anti-Black racism in K-12 schooling contexts and beyond. Islamophobia and gendered Islamophobia manifest in the absence of policies and structures that even acknowledge its existence or respond to its presence in Ontario classrooms. Transformative education has the possibility to disrupt and dismantle these harmful discourses and enactments in service of justice. And so this is what we are going to be speaking about today. These are the issues that we hope to address today in our, in our panel with our wonderful group that's gonna be joining us in a moment. Today's presentation uh, was made possible by the Faculty of Education, by the York University's Vice Provost Office, and by the Centre for Feminist Research. The Centre for Feminist Research, La Centre de Recherche Féministe, promotes feminist activities and collaborative research at York University and works to establish research linkages between York scholars and local, national, international, and transnational communities. Feminist research is conceived of in broad terms as being concerned with issues of women, gender, race, sexuality, ability, and feminism. The CFR is part of a North American network of feminist research organizations and is the host of the, in, of the interdisciplinary feminist sessions at the Annual Congress for Humanities and Social Sciences. Beginning last year, uh, the center, uh, and in particular, a group of um, amazing colleagues at York, uh, decided to put together the Spotlight on Islamophobia series. This was an attempt to further understand one of the most entrenched forms of racism, and it focuses on key aspects of the social forces that shape and reinforce contemporary practices of Islamophobia. Um, it aims to also gain a better understanding of the many forms of, Islam uh, of Islamophobia currently prevailing in multiple contexts grasping their historical origins in, spe in specific national contexts and their intersections with other regimes of inequality and oppressive forces. 
Before we move on formally to introducing our panel, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the land. Saima? Thank you. So we recognize that we have many individuals joining us from a variety of different locations. And so please take a moment to think of on the land upon which you are situated. Because we are hosting from York University, we are going to use a York University land acknowledgement. So we recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tokoronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon One Pump Out Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. And it's interesting, I was at a workshop a few years ago, and there were about 500 educators present within the space. And the facilitator asked everyone who spoke two languages or more to stand up. And I stood, I was very excited to stand amongst that group. Um, she then asked anybody who spoke three or more languages um, to remain standing, and a few of us had to sit down because we didn't have that threshold, and then she continued on to six languages. And when she got to the six languages, um, I looked around the room and there were only three people that remained standing, two of whom had um, hijabs on their heads, so visible uh, Muslim gendered women. And I thought to myself, that's really cool. That's a really, uh, that's a really great accomplishment. I'm so proud. And the speaker then asked, from those of you who are remaining standing, from the languages that you speak, are any of them indigenous, island, uh, indigenous languages of Turtle Island? And everybody sat down because <laughs> nobody could identify with that. Um, she then asked from anybody in this room, does anybody speak an indigenous language? And the whole room was silent. The speaker um, it, it, you know, was trying to bring, draw attention to the fact that um, it illustrated how Indigenous communities and heritages have been erased from our education system and that our daily activities in Canadians, we can continue with our business without even acknowledging the existence of Indigenous realities. Our socialization in the education system has so thoroughly done a complete job of allowing us to go about our business in the colonized fashion. Settler Muslims are no strangers to experiencing the trauma of colonialism. Almost all Muslim majority countries from West Africa to the South Pacific have histories of having been colonized and know the oppression, the theft of land and identity, the othering, the deficit lenses, and the retelling of stories and histories of peoples through the colonial glaze. These narratives are perpetuated globally since colonization has impacted us globally. And if we left if we leave these unexamined and unchallenged, this is the only narrative that will continue to prevail. How much do we understand about the truth of the violence and trauma of the history of the land upon which we have built our homes? We hold a moral responsibility in bearing witness to this history and understanding our contemporary social relationships from it. Muslim Canadians have an ethical obligation to understand and acknowledge the fact that by being in Canada, we've entered into treaty relationships with indigenous peoples of this land. These relationships come with particular responsibilities, including knowing the truth about the history of settler indigenous relations, as well as sitting in the tension of knowing that in our status as Canadians, unless we have indigenous intersections, we are complicit in settler colonialism. I call upon my brothers and sisters in the Muslim community and those who are amongst us here as, um, as a community of allies to think about the role that we play to correct these injustices. As Muslims, we are continuously encouraged through our faith practices to seek knowledge, to think critically about the world around us, to challenge injustices and oppression every time it happens. These are central to our faith. At a civic level, this means taking action by asking those in positions of power to be accountable to the efforts of reconciliation and to the proclaimed promises of policy changes to protect the land and water, which we have commodified for our personal capitalistic purposes. Many First Peoples are still fighting for basic human rights, for water, land, social services, healthcare, Indigenous education. How are we using our actions and our voices to seek justice in these situations? 
we must deepen our understanding of our obligations as treaty peoples. This requires breaking out of our colonized minds, whether we were social, socialized into it here on Turtle Island or whether we brought it with us from other lands that were also colonized, to recognize oppression and to disrupt it when we see it, through our actions, through our words, not being complicit in the continued oppression of Indigenous communities as we simultaneously strive for our own justices. In our faith practices, we are taught that no one can experience freedom until we are all free collectively. How are we embodying this teaching when we think of Indigenous realities? Understanding these truths and working towards reconciliation, not just in our minds, but also through our actions, particularly through education, are lifelong commitments. I would ask those of you who are present here today to bear witness to this event, to hold yourselves, to hold us, and to hold each other accountable. Reconciliation will only happen through the collective hands of all treaty peoples. Over to you, Vidya. Thank you. Hmm. Much of the time when we speak about systems of oppression, it's easy to get caught up in academic rhetoric or depersonalized st statistics. The fact is that every time we speak about the impacts of oppression, we are speaking about people. And today we are speaking about the devastating impact of oppressions like Islamophobia on the mental health, well being, and learning of children and their families. We'd like to share with you some stories to contextualize our learning today so that we do not lose sight of the human element of today's discussion. With the exception of publicly uh, available stories, we have protected the identities of students for fear of potential repercussions to them or their families. And so here's the first narrative. After seeing presidential candidate Donald Trump call on television for barring Muslims from entering the country, eight-year-old Sophia Yassini checked the locks on her family's home in Plano, Texas, imagining the army would take them away. She raced to her home and stuffed a pair of Barbie dolls, a tub of peanut butter and a toothbrush into a bag. She insisted on bringing boots for the long boat ride she imagined was coming. When her mother, Melissa, arrived home from work as a human resources, op uh, human resources worker, she ran to her mother and gave her a big hug. I want people to understand the impact that their words have on these children, Melissa Yassini said, who described the experience in a Facebook post. We often forget that we're waging war on one another with our words and we're adults. We can take it. The kids are suffering with this. They go to school every day and they're afraid to tell people they're Muslim. It has to stop. And we share this as an initial story in no way to perpetuate the myth of Canadian exceptional, exceptionalism. While this again is an American story, we know that anti-Muslim and anti-hate rhetoric are alive and well here in Canada. To illustrate this point, we're now going to share some Canadian Muslim testimonials of children in GTA school boards in, the, in both the uh, public boards as well as the Catholic boards. And this is the first. Whenever something bad happens in the world that involves a Muslim, I feel like I have to leave my house with armor. I always go prepared to deal with questions or ignorance. A grade 11 student. I have a lot of Muslims at my school, so I feel like the Islamophobia is not direct or blatant. People make jokes to Muslims about terrorism or bombing things, and everyone just passes it off as a joke. Grade 10 student. We had an athletics banquet uh, last year that fell during the second week of Ramadan. There were seven Muslims attending that were fasting. We asked that our meals be saved until after our time. Although we were told that this was going to happen, the organizers forgot about us. And all they could offer us during a sour time was some leftover salad. Grade 11 student. My school is 99% white. I am one of the few Muslims and I find that this has a negative impact on my learning environment. I feel like I am constantly having to deal with the assumptions made about Islam by my classmates and by teachers. I often find myself having to answer questions about gender issues, misogyny, terrorism, and violence as if they are Islamic things, grade nine student. With so many negative things being said about Muslims, I feel a lot of pressure to prove people wrong. I wear a hijab, so I already feel different. I get treated differently. 
So I have to try really hard at being the best, the most approachable, the funniest. I feel a lot of pressure to be exceptional. I can't make any mistakes. Grade nine student. This year, myself and a couple of other Muslim parents requested that our school council acknowledge Eid in May when selling cookies to students at our, at our regular recurring fundraiser. We asked for an Eid Mubarak label on the pre-purchased cookies that we sell several times a year. The provider was happy to provide the labels. The very same school council has hosted Christmas events, Valentine's Day cookie sales, Easter egg hunts, and more. When I pointed out the lack of diversity of those events, the amount of uh, hostility and vitriol that I received was disconcerting. Celebrating and acknowledging more diverse and inclusive events such as Lunar New Year, Diwali, Vaisakhi, etc., were largely ignored, overlooked, or dismissed. The simple request for inclusion and representation in a school with a very high percentage of Muslim students and in a school board with one in four Muslim student population turned into a hugely contentious and divisive issue. And finally, in an article written by Sri Pradhakar last year, who captured some of the experiences of um, Muslim students and families within the board, um, she said the following. The adults and students who reach out to the star shared stories of being bullied over their names. How many Muhammads are there in this family? A boy whose name was Anas being called Anus intentionally. Of not getting funding for clubs on par with other special interest uh, group clubs of the board not sponsoring and recognizing MIST, which is the Muslim Interscholastic Tournament, when others were also recognized, of having to fight with the removal of Islamophobic books from school libraries, of a student who pulled a hijab off of a girl being excused because he quote unquote, didn't know any better, of a teacher saying nothing when a student interrupted a presentation on the mosque shootings in New Zealand to yell, all Muslims are terrorists, and the Quran teaches hate and encourages Muslims to behead others. And while these are stories of K to 12 schooling in Ontario, as somebody that teaches in the Faculty of Education at York University, these stories do not end in grade 12. They are alive and present in our classrooms every day. One of the things that we are um, thinking about as well in our conversations today is that there's a small sample, you know, these are just a small sample of, of highly concerning examples of hate and discrimination experienced by Muslim students. And while it's tempting to think of these um, incidents as isolated or as only prevalent in the US, we'd like to share with you some Canadian statistics. And as we do, we would ask you to think about uh, what surprises you? What might you need to rethink or unlearn? And what might the impact of these Canadian sentiments, quote unquote, Canadian sentiments be on a child who identifies as both Muslim and Canadian? We'll just take a moment and uh, ask you to review these statistics. And again, how do these statistics influence the feelings of belonging, of acceptance of Muslim students in Ontario public schools? So at this moment, we would like to, um, oh, I'm sorry about this. Something happened with the formatting. 
but we would like to take a moment to introduce our uh, wonderful panel. Um, and we'll share, I'll share with you a, a little bit about them in alphabetical order. So first is Amira El Gawabi. Amira El Gawabi is a journalist and human rights advocate. She is currently contributing a uh, contributing columnist for the Toronto Star and Press Progress. Before joining the labor movement, Amira spent five years promoting the civil liberties of Canadian Muslims at the National Council of Canadian Muslims, NCCM, between 2012 and the fall of 2017. Amira is currently involved with several initiatives to counter hate and promote inclusion, including as a founding board member of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network and the Silk Road Institute. She recently served as a commissioner on the Public Policy Forum's Canadian Commission on Democratic Engagement. Her 2019 TEDx Ottawa talk is titled Multiculturalism Worth Defending. Please help me in welcoming Amira. Next, we have Jillary Massa. Jillary Massa is a proud Afro-Latina Muslim woman who lives in Toronto, Canada with her husband and two young children. She has a long-standing history in community engagement, public education, and activism related to equity, human rights, and social justice, and is the lead, consulting, lead consultant for inclusive leaders. With roots in both the labor movement and student movement, Jillary has spent the last 15 years supporting school boards, advocacy organizations, labor unions, government agencies, and private enterprises through organizational change work that centers human rights, equity, and inclusion. Jillary currently works as a human rights outreach and engagement officer at the Toronto District School Board and runs a small human rights and equity consultancy called Inclusive Leaders. Prior to this, Jillary spent three years working with the National Council of Canadian Muslims and CCM, supporting their efforts to respond to the rise in racism, white supremacy and Islamophobia across Canada. Through her work, she successfully secured a grant from Ontario's Ministry of Education to train and support educators across the province in better understanding and supporting the needs of Muslim students in Ontario. She trained over 3,000 educators, principals, and superintendents in anti-oppression and challenging Islamophobia, and has supported over 15 public and Catholic school boards in Ontario developing best practices. Jillary uh, is the author uh, of a community-based research project focused on amplifying the voices of Muslim students in public schools. The report uh, that came out of this project has been used system-wide to inform teacher training and changes with the school boards across Ontario. Welcome, Jillary. Omar Zia, uh, welcome Omar. Omar Zia is a secondary school administrator with the Peel District School Board. He is the chair of Muslims Employees Association of Peel and also the chair of the Muslim Educators Network of Ontario. He is active within the Muslim community as a well-known Khatib and lecturer in the GTHA, specializing in faith-focused, evidence-based parenting workshops and youth empowering workshops called Dean for Teens. Welcome, Omar. And Samia Ahmed. Samia Abdi, my, my apologies, is a senior public health specialist who holds a master's degree in public health and graduate diploma in social innovation and systems thinking. Her experience spans from co-creating local community engagement programs, such as Aspire to Lead and the City of Toronto Political Muslim Youth Fellowship to co-founding international movements, such as the Somali Gender Equality Movement and Famine Resisters. Samia has managed a multi-million dollar projects within the corporate sector, as well as led provincial healthcare initiatives. She is the winner of the Lori Chow Award for Exceptional Leadership and Health Promotion. She's also the, women, uh, the, the winner of Woman of the Year Award by the Federation of Muslim Women and the Max Woman of the Year Award. Samia is a mother, a community transformer, and a proud Scarboroughite. Welcome, Samia. Thank you so much, Vidya, for the introductions. And thank you to our panelists for being with us here today. Very excited to get the learning going. And so without further ado, we'd like to ask a question to all of you. Um, and the question we have for you is, from your vantage point, how does Islamophobia manifest for students and families and staff in K-12 settings? Maybe we will start with anybody super eager. <laughs> Maybe we'll start. I don't mind starting a bit if you'd like me to. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so thank you. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me to be part of this amazing uh, panel. I feel a bit outclassed, really, to be honest with you, listening to everybody's bio. Uh, but thank you for everybody to attend. I, I speaking to such a large, large crowd is a privilege uh, to be with all of you here. And hope that I, whatever I share can benefit all of us, including myself, first and foremost. So just to um, perhaps uh, get the conversation going with regards to this. I'm, I'm speaking from the point of view of, a, of an administrator, someone who identifies as Muslim, someone who identifies as South Asian and, and Canadian, and as a settler in stolen lands. And one of the first things that comes to my mind uh, with regards to this question is that just two days, three days ago, March 15th, uh, marks the third anniversary now, or two, sorry, second anniversary of the massacre in Christchurch, New Zealand which reminds me of our own anniversary here in our nation of the Quebec massacre that occurred. So when I think about how does Islamophobia manifest, I think about in direct and indirect terms. Indirect, indirect meaning that we have trauma that we have experienced as a society and as a globe, whether we're Muslim or not Muslim. Students, parents, people, all citizens of this nation when we hear about what's happening around the world, we can also experience it. I can share that till today, we now have security guards at all entrances of all mosques all the time outside of COVID, outside the COVID restrictions. That has changed how we enter our places of worship. At the same time, it has brought unity to people of faith, different faiths, where we've had circles of peace surrounding different faith worship centers to bring people together and show that support as a community. If I think about my own role, I'm with the Peel Justice School Board in 2017, 2016, 2017, we had what I call the Friday prayer fiasco, which made international headlines around the world, where we had a number of Islamophobes show up at the board office repeatedly every two weeks uh, with Islamophobia in their hands and in their minds, spewing hatred, spewing words of anti-Muslim hate, hate towards all faith groups, in fact, and at one point taking a copy of the Quran, ripping it up, throwing it on the ground, step, stepping on it. That's direct trauma, where students then are walking to school and wondering, you know, am I really welcome in this region? Am I really, really welcome in my school? What's my school board doing to protect my identity and to recognize my identity? And we look at an incident that happened in June of 2017, where a few Islamophobes showed up at a school, a secondary school in Mississauga, and the school had to be evacuated police were called to the actual area to ensure that there was no harm happening to students. Many students ended up leaving that school altogether because of the hurt and harm caused by members of the Islamophobic society. If I transfer to perhaps areas of, of students and the trauma that they also might uh, feel and how Islamophobia might manifest to them, we heard the, uh, the information pro provided by both Vidya and Saima from the quotations of both parents and students and what they have experienced um, not commenting on Peel because I will have to keep my job. <laughs> I'm just going to name a few other incidents that have occurred in other boards uh, where some comments that have been made include, it's not practical to pray five times a day. You're wearing hijab now. Oh, but you used to look so beautiful. Islamic Sharia does not belong in Canada. And you know, an often mentioned stereotypical wrong, erroneous view is the question, why do Muslims hate LGBTQ, 2SI community members? Um, and this is something that happened just very recently. I got an email about this, where this scarf was posted by a student uh, talking about what's important to, to him. And he was, this was seen as a symbol of terrorism. And his video and his presentation was removed from the Google Classroom that were shared. Um, do you really have hair under there? Speaking to a girl who wears hijab. A common comment, Islam oppresses women, that was mentioned in a grade 12 English classroom. Uh, teachers saying in, in gym class, you should wear a t-shirt because you'll sweat in the long sleeve shirt that you're wearing without understanding why Muslim girls might wear a long sleeve shirt. And aren't you hot in that hijab? And I'm sure many people who do wear hijab would, would have heard that. Some of the books that are, uh, that you know, in terms of how that Islamophobia might manifest in a very nonchalant way or an unknowing way are some of the books that we read, such as The Breadwinner by Deborah Ellis, which uh, continues to that further as a stereotype that Islam is, is a misogynistic religion, which uh, puts women down and they're silent and they're not allowed to speak, so on and so forth. Um, something my daughter mentioned to me about some of the authors that she's read this year in her 
uh, in her English class is that, you know, white privileged authors, she tells me, telling immigrant kids about how they should feel or what they should think about their culture and country that they left or even their faith. Um, and then uh, just moving towards some of the comments from staff, again, the question about how does uh, some of be manifest itself for staff in K-12 contexts. And so on a regular basis, every time 9-11 comes up, it's the anniversary that I believe a lot of staff would feel where they have to get, as one student mentioned, their armor on because there are going to be comments and there's going to be questions to specifically Muslim staff. I'm even happened to myself being an administrator where a member of staff came to me on 9-11, no longer mentioned the announcements, but he made a point to come and ask me, so today's 9-11, how do you feel about that? Right? So these are the kind of questions we might even get. A question that I have been asked. So Omar, do you practice jihad every night? Uh, you don't want to be known, so this was when I was uh, aspiring to become an administrator in the board, and I was told, you don't want to be known as that Muslim guy. These are comments to myself, right? So I want to make, you know, make that clear that this is a firsthand knowledge here. Um, also going to places where there's no accommodation for prayer space, and when asked, told that you can pray outside or pray in your car, I just don't pray at all. Why are you praying here at all to begin with? Being in a constant position to defend the faith. Uh, in one of my earlier positions as a teacher, and one of the one of my colleagues would make it a point every, sing every single day, and I'm not joking, for every single day for three years, he would come armed with a question to question something about a verse in the Quran or something about the Islamic faith. It made it very difficult to, 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 to work there and was one of the reasons I ended up leaving. Uh, staff refusing to recognize Islamic heritage month. And then something that, often, this is something I'm sharing with my daughter because she's experiencing this now as a, as a, as a grade nine student, is the, is the letter Z. She asked me to make sure I mentioned this because there's gonna be a lot of people in the room. She says, you know, one thing that, uh, you know, if you're to help, the letter Z that's used in the word Muslim or Islam, where people are, are pronouncing as Muslim or Muslim or Islam. She's, and forgive me, I'm gonna say a bad word. She says, you may as well call me Paki because it's so offensive to be called a Muslim. And for those who are not aware, when you take the S from Muslim to a Z as in Muslim, you take the word peace and you call and you make it oppressor, right? Or tyranny. So the word Muslim is someone who, who oppresses and creates tyranny in the land. A Muslim is someone who adheres to peace and brings peace to the land. Small difference, but it does make a difference. And you know, her being in 14 years old in grade nine, I want to make sure that I had to share that with you. Um, one last, uh, I apologize if I'm monopolizing a bit too much here. I just wanted to to share a few more ideas regarding what families and how Islamophobia manifests for families. And that is that seeking help during Ramadan for their fam for their student, for their children. Seeking exemption from curriculum where they're met with a lot of opposition. And because they are not aware of their rights as parents and what they can or cannot ask for in terms of accommodations, they seem to operate from a place of fear, not wanting to accept uh, to upset the teacher or administration for fear of loss of marks or post-secondary opportunities being lost as well. Um, also giving, being given the last priority, this is an example of a black Muslim parent who came to see the principal and was made to wait the entire day without being seen. And then she overheard the parent, uh, so the principal saying to the, secret, to the office manager that I don't want to deal with her, she's black and she's Muslim and I don't see their concerns as worthy. That's the actual statement that was mentioned to me, not in my board again, but from a different board, but the fact that a parent actually experienced that and heard that can be quite detrimental. So thank you for letting me share. I apologize if I spoke for too long or too much. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Jillary, did you wanna jump Yeah, in? I mean, I think a lot of the things that Omar mentioned um, are things that we're, we see across the province when it comes, particularly when it comes to students. For me, when I think about um, a word to describe or a few words to describe the experiences of Muslim students, Muslim teachers, Muslim families and community um, is, is erasure. I think particularly for those of us who live at the intersection of Muslimness and something else, disability, Blackness, queerness, um, we're only ever seen or accommodated or thought about often negatively from our Muslim identity, from the perspective of our Muslim identity. Um, especially, you know, I hear a lot from young Black Muslim boys who often get questioned about their Muslimness. Whereas for me, I get questioned about my Blackness because I wear a hijab and what's vi most visible or recognizable is the fact that I'm Muslim. And so this concept of erasure, and I, I think back even to myself when I was in, in high school and in university, as Vidya said, you know, this is not something that just ends at grade 12. Um, this is a time in young folks' life that they're really trying to understand their identity in the world um, as 
contributing members of society. Um, politically, they're trying to understand their identity. Uh, from a faith perspective, they're trying to understand their identity. And, they're, and then they're confronted with daily questions about their faith. Explain to me the nuances of hijab. Explain to me the nuances about gender segregation. Explain to me your opinion and your religion's opinion about homosexuality. Like, you know, they people are requiring our 15, 14, 13, 10-year-old, 8-year-old to understand some of the really complex issues that, you know, our scholars are starting to tr try to digest for our communities. Um, and it's, um, you know, I think that that's the biggest piece where, you know, you feel this flight, fight or flight moment where you want to defend the identity that you are proud of, the religious identity that you've grow, grown up around, um, but you don't fully understand all of it. You're still trying to digest it yourself and tr really trying to understand how it fits and is part of your own, um, you know, your own Muslimness. You know, I, I think back to um, my daughter, my daughter's five. And when she was in junior kindergarten, um, somebody had asked her, somebody had asked something, one of the other kids had asked something about why I wore a hijab. And the teacher relayed to me that um, somebody had asked this and then, you know, she asked Iman to come to the front of the class and explain it. And, you know, I understood that this teacher thought that she was doing something really good. She was including culturally responsive pedagogy in the classroom. She was doing all of the things um, that were, were reasonable. And I'm like, dude, she's five. Like, how do you expect her to have a nuanced conversation about, about hijab, modesty, choice, all of these things at five years old, when even myself with my daughter, I'm just starting to introduce to her the concept of we're a Muslim family. This is what Islam says. This is what we believe. This is why we do this and your Christian cousin does the other. This is why we can have a pepperoni. We can't have pepperoni pizza and Nathan can, right? Like we're just starting to baby steps introduces to her and her teacher puts her in the front of the classroom to teach the class about hijab. And, you know, I think that often these things happen really subtly and I think they happen with the best of intentions, but the impact of these things is that you're um, requiring our young people who are still trying to sift out their identities and understand who they are and how they're placed uh, in their diverse school, in their diverse classrooms or sometimes not very diverse classrooms and how much of themselves they wanna just show um, to really oftentimes strangers, people who have not done the work to build relationships and really understand community. So for me, I think um, the word that I would use is a constant erasure, erasure of the diversity that is within the Muslim community when it comes to um, identity, racial identity, gender identity, sexual identity, um, but also um, an expectation that all of us will know everything about um, our faith as if we, we all follow and adhere and understand um, how we apply our religion to our lives in the same way. Right. Thank you so much, Jillary. Thank you, Megan. Alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for creating this space for us to have this conversation. Um, I don't know if we've taken a moment to remember um, the um, eight people who were killed recently um, as a result of white terrorism and hate. Um, and um, the, the women who are, who are killed uh, again because of the work that they do and the, the racism that comes with it. So it's important for us as we talk about um, Islamophobia that we recognize that um, our form of hate um, is um, are interconnected and interlinked. Uh, and um, thank you, um, Saima, for doing that really amazing, um, thoughtful land, land acknowledgement and, and putting us, um, calling us out on our responsibilities to um, the land that we are on and, and the legacy of a colonization that we are part of and benefiting from. Uh, and with that obviously comes with um, uh, the responsibility for also understanding that this land also has a history of um, slavery and a continuous of anti continu continuation of anti-Black racism as a corner store of how this uh, country was built. Um, uh, on top of um, colonization. Um, so all of the isms that we, we know that um, exist do not, um, do not operate uh, separate from each other. Uh, so just as a starting point. And uh, so just uh, what I wanted to add is uh, that also Islamophobia is experienced by um, students, uh, not only from administrators and teachers, but they are also, it's also experienced from fellow students, um, sometimes in the form of, of um, 
jokes or uh, racial slurs or bullying or continuous reminders and othering, uh, as well as uh, similar to what uh, Jewelry says, questions, but not questions for uh, understanding and learning, but questions for um, othering and ostracizing um, students. And when uh, there are no um, mechanisms to support the students in the forms of teachers and administrators who are um, educated and, and pa passionate and, and empathetic. Um, so then these students are left alone and sometimes, um, you know, uh, their only outlet might be their parents. And then that have, again, uh, such as what um, Brother Omar shared around the parents, again, not being listened to in these systems. Um, uh, another uh, quick story that I wanted to share is sometimes also how teachers share misinformation and Islamophobic texts. Uh, so I remember my younger sister being in school and her teaching uh, saying that jihad was the sixth pillar of Islam and Islam actually had six pillars and jihad was the responsibility of every single Muslim. And my sister being like in grade five, trying to argue with her teacher, uh, but obviously lo losing that battle. Um, again, the idea of um, guidance counselors, and we know this is 20 years ago, and I'm going to date myself, but being in university and then having conversations with um, first you know, year students who've had been told by their guidance counselors that they can't possibly make it to an engineering school or they cannot make it into nursing or they're, they're not smart enough to go to university. Um, and that's again, you know, coming from the intersection of, of blackness and Islam, and always being questioned in terms of your skills and your abilities to uh, be, you know, smart enough and, and to do well enough in school. And then um, if we think from like a higher administrative perspective, like having situations like a principal, um, this is um, a, a principal in uh, Brampton uh, saying that uh, Muslim students are interested in learning about science because they're interested in making bombs and still keeping her job. She's, I, I, I looked her up right before, you know, like, so this like almost two years later, uh, after making that comment and still there's no consequences to the actions of Islamophobia. And then finally, like just, beginning of this month with the thing, uh, the, the nominations of a, the first black Muslim woman uh, for, for a secondary school to be named after and uh, the visceral hateful reaction of the school trustee um, saying things like uh, the nomination could not possibly come from Canadians that uh, that it came from the the, the results the overwhelming results of uh, Hodan Nale's name being uh, nominated through school um, at the, the school community is a foreign intervention <laughs> using Trump language uh, and then uh, saying that also accusing a whole the whole Muslim community of fraud because possibly we cannot have that much supporters or that many Muslims in, in Vaughan region or in the York um, region uh, this school district. So showing up Islamophobia being shown to us from the level of us at a student level to a teacher teachers levels to administrators to principals to school trustees um just that it is across the system and it is experience in different levels and definitely um it's something that is not new that that is you know for for those of uh you know, for those of uh, uh, us or those uh, members of our communities who've been to, to the school board through the school board system 30 years ago and 40 years ago and 20 years ago, the stories are on, on repetition. It's the same stories that, you know, that uh, um, my generation went through, that my daughter's generations are going through and hopefully not my, you know, like I, I do have also a, a little niece, nieces and nephew and hopefully there will be a chance to kind of break that cycle. Sorry, I said I was muted. I said, thank you. Thank you so much, Samia, for sharing. Um, and Amira? 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, first, I also want to acknowledge the land uh, that I'm on right now. I am coming uh, to you all from Ottawa on the Anishinaabe Algonquin unceded territory. I want to just take a quick moment to also thank the Center for Feminist Research uh, for organizing this Islamophobia series. It's really wonderful uh, to be here with all these distinguished panelists, many of whom are my friends. Um, so it's lovely. I wish we were meeting in person, of course, but it is what it is. Uh, Vidya and Sayyima, thank you so much as well for all the work and for the over 130 people who are joining us right now. Thank you for taking the time um, and making this issue um, a priority in your day. Um, so just to, to riff off of what everyone has been saying so far, um, you know, there was a, a, a really powerful quote um, that I came across uh, in some of the work that I've done. Um, and it was from a grade 11 student at York Region District School Board. And he said very simply, every Muslim high school student wants their teachers to first view them as a student, just like everyone else. So even the idea of all that we're talking about today, um, identity, intersecting identities, and all of the the heavy weight that you know that is sort of thrust onto our children. Even you know, uh, as as uh, Jillary was saying, you know, on her five year old, um, this is this is a lot of weight that we're putting on our young people, and it's and it's a burden. It is a, it is a heavy burden, um, and so. Um, while we think about these issues, it is to remember and center those students, those young people who simply want to just go about uh, their experiences in school. They want to achieve, they want to contribute. They want to be, uh, you know, not necessarily singled out for all of this negativity or even just the, the over attention that, that uh, some, sometimes they will feel. Um, and the other thing I wanted to sort of tease out as well is that for those of us working in advocacy and you know uh, myself I worked for about five years at the National Council of Canadian Muslims um, had a chance to work with Jillary there as well and one really important principle in my mind was while we were doing a lot of work more broadly in society for instance you know advocating against discrimination against Muslim women like like those of us on the call who wear the, the hijab and who for example will have disproportionate discrimination in the workplace or in seeking to have employment or services in health or education um, as we're advocating for these rights that are guaranteed to us in the charter a constant thought was really driving me to think about education in that what is the point of doing all of this advocacy at the society level where we're you know calling on workplaces for instance to create spaces for prayer for anyone any anyone who with any background who wants to, to be able to have that reasonable accommodation what is the point of doing all of that work if by the time that these young children and young people get into for instance the workplace that they are too ashamed to even request these accommodations. That they are already have been so um, diminished um, and almost shamed for these various identities that they have been forced to sort of carry and grapple with uh, rather than celebrate and, and, and love, um, then really we've, we've almost shot ourselves in the foot because if we focus solely on the broader societal area of uh, civil liberties and civil rights and advocating for uh, every person in this country to be treated uh, you know, equally and under the charter, under our human rights codes, uh, we are going to fail these young people because simply uh, all of that, those hard fought rights will not be uh, useful to them. They will not even claim those rights. And that is really very powerful to me. We know already that on that societal level, Muslims in Canada are already experiencing unwarranted heightened scrutiny in education, in stores and shopping malls and housing and workplaces on buses, subways and trains, at airports, at border crossings in healthcare, by private security, child welfare agencies, etc. In fact, there was a report by the Ontario Human Rights Commission a few years ago called Under Suspicion, in which it actually did a breakdown uh, along all uh, equity seeking communities to look at these exact spaces where discrimination was being felt. And so knowing that type of discrimination exists out there, knowing that these are not simply, you know, adults experiencing them on a one on one level, but these are families, these are parents who may be experiencing siblings, older siblings, younger siblings, people who are experiencing this type of discrimination are obviously going to have some 
relative connection to the education system as well. And so if our conversations within classrooms are not acknowledging those lived realities or not providing the space for young people to understand or explore or, or interrogate these experiences and acknowledge these experiences, then again, we are silencing and potentially shaming these, uh, these young people for the experiences that they are having in our society. Um, and before I keep going, I do want to take a moment just to, to provide a definition of what we mean when we're saying Islamophobia. There is, there are, so I should say, many different definitions to this term. The one that I often point to is from the Ontario Human Rights Commission, um, and it's a very simple one. It is that Islamophobia is racism, stereotypes, prejudice, fear, or acts of hostility, hostility directed towards individual Muslims or followers of Islam in general. And so the political climate that we are in as well will have a, an impact, a direct sometimes impact on our education system across all grades. For instance, in the past, we've seen the rise of groups like Daesh uh, that were you know, horrifically committing acts of terrorism around the world. And during sort of a time where there was heightened awareness around this heightened attacks, you know, there were there would be, you know, um, examples where our young people were, you know, really suffering from the constant barrage of news and emphasis on Muslims being engaged in this type of terrorist activity. I remember one tweet that I've often shared in uh, previous uh, presentations in schools, and it was a woman who tweeted, you know, my, my niece is asking me whether I don't tell anyone that I'm Muslim anymore following an attack. And the, the person who wrote the tweet said, you know, she's five, she's five years old wondering if she should stop telling people she's Muslim because of the constant negative, negative news about her faith and the religion that her family and her follow. Um, and so we know that that political atmosphere impacts our schools. We know that it impacts not only on our young people and our students, but impacts on educators as well and how they perceive um, Muslim students. For instance, when I was at the NCCM and we were doing work around human rights cases, you know, oftentimes during the period where we were having the debate around bringing Syrian refugees to Canada, for those of you who recall this, there was a lot of hostility in parts of the broader public. While there was support and there was an outpouring of support and welcome, there was also that flip side um, of, of negativity. And what we started to see was that, you know, educators, a minority of course, but we would hear reports of educators saying negative things about refugees. One comment I remember is a teacher saying to a student um, when discussing the refugees coming and saying, you know, I don't know that we should bring everyone in. There may be bad ones among them. Right. And these are things that stick with students. You know, the parent who called us about this comment, you know, told us that her young son came home crying when that comment was made. Or another uh, uh, example uh, here, very close to me here in, in Ottawa, where a young student said to a teacher, um, I'm going to be late on my assignment. Can I have an extension? And the teacher said, oh, are you going to bomb us if I don't give it to you? Ha ha ha. And with a laugh. And of course, you know, how, you know, when we hear these things, they're shocking, but they're happening and they do happen. And so we often would hear from families really unsure of what can they do. And we heard a little bit about that already, but what can they do around these issues? The other, the other example of, again, that climate that's impacting was the rise of Donald Trump. And thankfully we can say former president Donald Trump, but during, during the, his, you know, initial presidential run, we saw, we saw online hate ex extremely increase by 600% here in Canada, let alone what was going on in the US. And there was a very important study that I came across from 2016 that found in the United States, children between the ages of five and nine years old were internalizing the zeitgeist to the point where one in three children did not want to tell anyone they were Muslim. And one in two, did not know whether they could be both American and Muslim. So can they, for instance, here for our context, can these students be both Canadian and Muslim? And that one in six students would pretend not to be Muslim, that they didn't even want to let anyone know that they were Muslim. 
The other point, again, that we would hear also, and it was been raised, I think it was Samia that talked about curriculum, and as well as uh, Omar, the curriculum that we have seen, we've seen examples where, uh, for instance, an activity around uh, Malala Yousafzai talking about her, uh, her efforts and, and, and her, uh, you know, the, the, the work that she's done around education for girls in Afghanistan, um, you know, how that has, you know, or Pakistan, how, how Pakistan was, quote unquote, a backward country, uh, and how, uh, you know, the people were not able to uh, find their own voice and really painting the country as extremely problematic and not relatable to those kids who actually whose families come from those countries and they couldn't see themselves in 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 the way that their homes home homelands were being reflected and again families trying to raise these issues with educators and often finding um you know really a closed door uh for them um and so you know and and sort of to, to sort of to bring it to a bit of a, of a close on this question the sad thing is that up until about 2017 uh, we were, as an advocacy organization, working with uh, educators, trying to really bring the issue of Islamophobia more to the forefront. And we actually had piloted that Islamophobia workshop for educators in 2016, um, that we had a, an agreement with the Ontario Ministry of Education. In, the, in that uh, September to December period of 2016, we had very little interest even though all that I'm describing, that political zeitgeist was real, Islamophobia was real and impacting people and impacting our young kids, but there just was an appetite. It wasn't until the Quebec City mosque shooting in 2017, in January 29th, 2017, where within, of course, sadly and tragically within weeks, suddenly we were getting huge demand for the, for the presentation. It's sad that it took the murder of six men for people to truly tune in and understand what we've been saying for so long. And that is that Islamophobia is real. It is a threat to our well-being and safety. It is harming our communities. Um, and this is a shared issue that we all have to work around together. Oh, I'm not muted. Um, thank you, Omar, Jillary, Samia, Amira, so much um, that you've given us to think about in that moment. Just to let you know, you're not getting them, but I'm getting a lot of private messages over here praising all of you. Um, so just wanted to, we'll share those with you later on, uh, thanking you for your comments. Um, certainly, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear um, how you're speaking from your different vantage points in, your, in the system, and yet there's all that commonality that we hear in terms of the oppressive nature and the impact on mental health and wellness on the students and families and community members. Um, and one thing that I'm hearing come up recurringly is this idea of denial. It's, you know, a denial in, uh, and, and you need to have these moments of, of what we, we want, the second worst massacre in Canadian history. Like, is that what we want? That's what, that's what we need to, you know, recent Canadian history anyway, um, in order for us to pay attention to an issue. And even then for it's the five minutes of fame and then what we move on because everything is um, solved. Um, I think that that lack of an understanding that when, communities and parents and children are expressing that these are things that are happening, these are our experiences, that that needs to be taken seriously because those are manifestations of larger symptomatic things that are kind of building up. And we don't want to get to the point where there's like a big news story. Like nobody wants to get to that point. I mean, I would hope the majority of us don't want to get, Muslim or not, we don't want to get to that point. But why is it that we need to have those moments in order for people to pay attention? And uh, a lot of the time um, that erasure is justified through people's intentions. Like, oh, that wasn't intended that way. Well, how was it intended exactly then? Uh, because this is not something that is, you know, um, hidden. It is pervasive. It's everywhere around you, whether you're looking at media for the purpose of news or whether you're watching, you know, a show for the purpose of, enjoyment, like even then you can't escape because all of these uh, shows always paint a certain picture about who the bad person is and you can tell by their dress and their accents and so on and so forth. So, you know, um, can't even escape that way. Um, so that emotional labor is put onto our children and then put onto the communities. And at the same time, there's a lack of acknowledgement and then there's a simultaneous allowance for this type of rhetoric to continue. 
because of that lack of acknowledgement. So I think really you've spoken to really the idea that um, when we talk about Islamophobia and its manifestations, and you're speaking to all these different ways, these insidious ways that they impact everybody's lives, um, but because they're not acknowledged or they're not labeled or they're not given that appetite, um, you know, for, uh, for whatever reason, um, as a result, it's allowed to continue. I think, Saima, um, for me, I, it's important for to encourage folks, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim educators, whether they're non-Muslim or Muslim educators, to take a step back and really push um, up against this, this assumption that our education systems and other institutions are neutral. And once you start from the premise that these institutions are not neutral and they were built for a particular purpose and they were built to push particular narratives and to normalize particular identities, then we can approach Islamophobia, homophobia, sexism, anti-Black racism within the school system from that place, from the assumption that there is work to do here, as opposed, you know, I think the, the to me, it hurts me that we have to like put all of our pain out and give you all of these examples that feel like these big, um, unbelievable moments for people to have some empathy or feel some shame for a system that's not um, um, accommodating or thinking about its marginalized students. And in this case, it's Muslim students. But if we started from the premise that these are not neutral spaces and as an agent in the space, as somebody who works in the space, it's my responsibility to think about my own lack of neutrality and what do I need to do to break a system that is unequal, then I think we can move along in a, a number of different ways, not just on Islamophobia, but on, on all the other kind of ways the systems of repression show up in our schools. And it would also allow us to um, understand the intersectional ways that these issues um, come up, right? So I, I got a question about how to support um, Muslim queer, queer Muslim students um, as a Muslim educator. And I think starting from a point that allows a student to show up as a Muslim and as a queer person at the same time and not like, you know, I think often the, 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 the um, Islamophobia shows up in that situation with the kind of um, need or uh, knee jerk reaction to downplay or, um, or erase the Muslim identity of that student. But often that's not what that student wants. Sometimes it is and sometimes it, not, it isn't. Sometimes a student is just trying to figure out how can I be, what support systems are out there so I can be both those things without it feeling like a contradiction that has been placed by a number of different places, right? From my maybe my family who doesn't understand what this means and why this is important to me and who I am and how to honor these both of these identities and a non-Muslim community who also sees them as odds to one another. So really I think, um, thinking about ways to not require students to just pick and choose who they are, whether they're black and Muslim, queer and Muslim, women and like, you know, I think that often we set up these false dichotomies as institutions. And so starting from that premise in supporting our students is, is really important. Secondly, I think let's not frame the issue of homophobia and transphobia as only a Muslim problem. I work in a human rights office at a school board and I see students um, challenged with gender identity, um, their sexual orientation from Muslim and non-Muslim families with families that don't understand, teachers that don't understand, students that don't understand, their peers who don't understand. And so, yes, it's an issue that I think internally as a Muslim community, we have to take on um, and think about how do we better support so that we don't lose souls, quite frankly. But I also think um, as a kind of broader in the school board sense, um, it, it, with other institutions, let's not treat it as if the issue of homophobia and transphobia is only a Muslim problem, because I think that many communities are really challenged with uh, um, understanding how to include and how to allow our queer brothers and sisters to live with dignity and respect. Um, and, you know, so I, I think that that's what I would say that we, a lot of this comes from, I think, the inability for us to be frank and admit that our institutions are not neutral. If we start from that basis, um, a lot of things I think would fall better into place. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Jillary. You've actually taken us into kind of a, a naturally said, no, 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 it's perfect. It's you segmented us, segmented us into the kind of like the second area that we were hoping to bring up in the panel in terms of um, challenges is uh, what are the challenges that exist in disrupting Islamophobia in schools at the individual level as well as the system level? 
And how does it manifest differently given multiple and intersecting Muslim identities? You actually just naturally spoke to it. And I mean, certainly um, that you've spoken to the notion of silos and um, the idea that we're asked and tasked to work in silos and who decides what these silos of identities are, right? That's certainly something that you've just uh, brought up, which I think is critical. Um, and I'm just wondering if anybody else has any other comments on uh, those challenges that exist in disrupting Islamophobia. I think one of the, um, just piggyback on what you said earlier, Simon, about the influence of media and various forms of media, whether it be books, TV shows, movies, comics, even commercials, <laughs> and how they have further Islamophobia, how they portray Muslims. And I think if I look, if I if I look back at maybe the last 20 years, I think that 9-11 allowed for Islamophobia to become normalized to the point where when you bring up the concept of anti-Muslim hate or Islamophobia, it's often ignored. And mainly I think because we can't see it. Uh, the identity of Muslim is not necessarily a skin color. It's not necessarily a physical feature that you have somewhere that's prominent. It could be a dress code, but it might not be a specific dress code. We know that Muslims are not a monolith. How a person wears their head covering, whether it's a hijab, niqab, burqa, abaya, is completely different from person to person. Uh, the way a person might have a beard, not have a beard, that is completely different. And to be honest with you, in, in today's you know, fashion for men, it seems like the beard is the in thing for everybody. So it doesn't mean anything necessary to have a beard, whether that portrays you as, as a Muslim or not a Muslim. Um, even the way a person might practice, whether they pray or don't pray, whether they fast or don't fast, or how much they fast and how they fast, etc. All this changes from person to person. And I, I recall a, a, a moment where there were these two uh, twin uh, girls, students of mine, who had immigrated from the Philippines. They were Muslim. They were wearing hijab, but they were not wearing the typical uh, uh, typical hijab. It was it was very unique. It was um, almost like a straw cone hat with uh, a, a, a cloth or like a, a scarf around it, and they were told to remove it because it was not recognized as the typical hijab, and they were told to remove it by the phys ed teacher. We were able to confront the situation and disrupt it from happening, but the point is that even the kids and the families and the two parents themselves were afraid to come forward, and they had no idea how to deal with the situation at all. They made the assumption that in Canada you cannot wear, I guess, the Filipino version of the hijab that those girls were wearing. Um, so this is, uh, I mean, that kind of, this is just speaking towards intersectionality. Um, you know, we, we, there are many examples that, that I think we might come across of, of students who have intersectionality and perhaps how they're treated and, and becoming more aware of how they're treated and, and, and the fact that maybe both identities are not always seen, uh, hopefully open a window for us to look at more than one identity of a student that they can be more than one identity. And then sometimes when they do hold more than one identity, they're, not, they're facing more than one barrier as a result of that or a series of inequities. Uh, I remember that in one school I was teaching at, there were these six boys from the same family they were not called students, they're not called black, they're not called Muslim, they're called the Somalis. It's very hurtful and very harmful language that staff use this. It took me a couple of days before I figured out what they were referring to, you know, and then put, my, put myself in a position to disrupt it, but that had been going on for years. These kids were in grade 12 by the time I got to that school. Um, I recall I went one time to the Nigerian Canadian Muslim Association, this is maybe two or three years ago, uh, to give a presentation on Islamophobia. To that, to that community, to, to, to their mosque or cultural center. And um, you know, a typical workshop for me might be an hour and a half, maybe two hours if it goes that long. I was there for just under four hours listening to horrific stories from this community of parents, students, even the imam uh, of, the, of the center sharing stories of Islamophobia and anti-Black racism. And I'm, I remember, I, I, Forgive me for, for smiling or laughing, but I remember this one sister that stood up. Um, she just, she's not wear hijab and, and she was at her workplace and she was asking for time off for, for Eid. And her employer said, what, you're Muslim? I thought you were just black. You know, and she laughed about it during that time. because It was just, um, it, it gives you an idea that when you, if I'm there for four hours, it, it could clearly demonstrate that Islamophobia is not just about faith, but it's about being black and Muslim as well in the multitude of areas that they, the experience. And definitely as as uh, as as we was mentioning about you know the 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 struggle of our queer community, the LGBTQ2SI community, uh, who are Muslim. 
and that they find difficulty within their own families, within their own Muslim community, but also when they're experiencing situations in school settings where teachers will make the assumption, as was mentioned, that they cannot be both. And so they'll focus on support for one and not support for the other. And some situations, maybe having having conversations with, with students privately to maybe, you know, leave their families and embrace one and not the other and not understanding how they can support both. And perhaps not being aware that the, the queer Muslim society is a real thing. They have an imam, they have followers, they have a masjid, they have gatherings, and perhaps becoming more aware of the systems that are already in place to support students who are experiencing more than one identity. Thank you. I think the, the siloed nature of the way that we talk about things really does put that barrier in it because not only are we perpetuating singular narratives, right? So it, it, it allows the singular narrative to perpetuate, but it also really doesn't build that fulsome understanding of, of the complexities of what it means to be somebody who identifies as Muslim. It doesn't allow for those. It's almost like a privilege to have an individual identity um, when you're Muslim a lot of the time. And of course, then the emotional labor is the, but I, I, that fighting for your human right to have identity in a space and your own voice to define who it is that you are. So absolutely, thank you so much for sharing all those um, spaces, uh, those examples of things that are happening in different spaces. Um, so I'm looking at the time and we're actually almost out of time, believe it or not, we've had, I feel like we just started. Um, but what I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to um, allow, I mean, and Samia and Amira, please, if you had anything to contribute to that, I'm gonna throw out question number three that I would have liked to address to the panel. And if you wanna address number three, that's fantastic. We'll still have some time for a Q and A at the end. So certainly if there's any leftover thoughts, we'll spill into there as well. But the third question I wanted to ask the panel is how can schools and school districts address these issues directly? Um, what is required to create more humanizing experiences for Muslim students and for Muslim communities? So maybe you can talk about the two in, uh, in conjunction with each other. Maybe you have some, sh uh, some wisdom to share with us, those of us who are here who are trying to create those spaces. Sam? Yeah, so I can jump in. Um, so there's a, the one point that I wanted to mention around the second question and around barriers is this concept, um, this term called the perfect stranger coined by an indigenous uh, scholar, Dr. Susan Dion. And the idea is that um, particularly in education, but um, generally um, as Canadians, uh, she has been speaking about teachers specifically um, that um, act like the perfect stranger to indigenous uh, uh, concerns or indigenous realities. So this idea of like um, always pleading ignorance, always saying, I, I don't know enough about this topic. Um, I'm not sure how to address it. I'm not confident enough, um, despite the fact that and, and um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, all of our oppressions are interconnected and interrelated. So equally, uh, if we are to use that perfect stranger anal analogy for Islamophobia, it, it despite uh, Muslim scholars, uh, educators, students, uh, parents, communities, bringing this topic forth again and again and again, and the plethora of um, trainings and uh, um, you know materials that are available for people, still people hide behind the veil of ignorance and not knowing enough. Um, and and when when they they commit acts of Islamophobia and violence against uh, students can just retreat back to the fact that, that they did not know it better. Um, so that's what I just wanted to you know introduce that concept. And the other thing is around uh, what I guess uh, school districts and schools can do. Um, and knowing also that folks in the room right now with us are not necessarily administrators or educators that we are all actually uh, approaching or sitting in different places. So this idea of acting from where you are uh, with whatever little or lots of power you have within your circle of influence uh, is, is, is the key here. Um, so if you are in a place of decision making, uh, thinking about what policies, procedures and practices can actually be changed in, in terms of naming and addressing Islamophobia explicitly and not just using vague language such as um, diverse, uh, diversity and inclusion that does not name what that means and who are we talking about. Um, mandating trainings um, such as anti-Islamophobia and, and, and anti-Islam racism trainings. And we know that uh, 
especially over this year that um, training and education sometimes is used as a as a scapegoat at a checkpoint as a uh, tokenistic way of pretending that we're moving forward by um, you know having people do one hour or two hours training and that's why I said policy and practices change first then training not the other way around um, we talked about curriculum updates and the idea of uh, recognizing that we're new, not newcomers to this land necessarily. And um, uh, Muslim historian uh, Hassan Munir, Hassan Hassan Munir actually had done an excellent report around, uh, you know, documenting Muslim presence uh, over for one over 150 years uh, on this land, and knowing that there was actually also Muslims that came through Black Muslims that came to this land through the transatlantic. Right. Um, so this idea of that we, we just came and we're just like trying to fit into the Canadian society and we're all newcomers and we're all struggling is, is a fallacy and, and, and educators and teachers need to understand that, uh, first of all, we're here to stay. Second of all, we're not newcomers. Some of us are, and that is okay. But a lot, so a lot of us also have very, very deep and long roots in this, in, in, in this country and in this land. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to say is this idea of um, faith-based uh, data collection, uh, because we cannot manage what we cannot measure. So this idea of knowing of what's the percentage of Muslim students that, that are actually in our school boards, what's the percentage of Muslim teachers that are reflected in the school boards. Um, and then this idea of reporting, reporting, reporting. Uh, so the, uh, the NCCM has been doing an excellent job tracking uh, incidents of Islamophobia, but it's very important for us to continue reporting these incidents and being able to have researchers like, all, like yourselves um, kind of continuously talking about this as a way to uh, keep the spotlight on this topic so then it's not um, you know, shoved under the rack and then that we're not having the continuous pretense of like, this does not exist in our school board or this does not happen in where we are standing. Um, finally, the, the last thing is advocacy. And Amir, I'm sure we'll touch upon this work around advocacy. But uh, again, whether you are part of the school board or not, uh, thinking through the system, this is a systems uh, issue that, uh, uh, that you need to be able to pull the lever whether you are in education or employment or economic development or in your healthcare like myself, the idea is where and how are you able to influence um, the general perceptions around Muslim, Muslimness, Islam, Islamophobia, and uh, where are you able to um, you know, make these things um, change? Um, then that reflect back and that ripple effect that comes back to the education system. I tried to talk as fast as I could. <laughs> Thank you, Samia. <laughs> Not for talking fast, for the amazing tips you're giving us in terms of moving communities forward. Thank you. Amira? Yeah, such, all, all such great interventions. Um, I put in the chat a definition of the term systemic faithism, uh, which the Ontario Human Rights Commission had come out with a few years back. And I was just absolutely, you know, fascinated by this term. Um, and I remember in some of the workshops I, I did with educators, you know, asking people if they'd ever heard of it. And, and of course, many of us haven't heard of that before and don't often hear about it sort of in, in public discourse. Um, but it's a fascinating term and I'll just read out the definition. Um, it refers to the ways that cultural and societal norms, systems, structures, and institutions directly or indirectly, consciously or unwittingly promote sustain or entrench differential disadvantage or advantage for individuals and groups based on their faith, understood broadly to include religious and non-religious belief systems. So, you know, if we were in an interactive <laughs> uh, workshop right now, I would, I would, I would ask people to, to think of, you know, what are examples of systemic faithism, you know, in our schools? And, you know, I would assume and guess that many of you would think, okay, you know, there are certain things that are done almost without thinking. You know, I, because of virtual school and I'm, I'm seeing what the kids are doing, my, my own children, my, my uh, second grader, it goes without saying that, you know, they're gonna do Valentine's Day cards. It goes without saying that they're going to do Christmas messages. It goes without saying that there's going to be a Halloween activity. It goes without saying, but there was nothing, uh, you know, necessarily looking at, um, you know, Ramadan 
in, in his school in particular, there was nothing necessarily looking at other Diwali or what have you, or if there was uh, looking at other cultural uh, occasions, Chinese New Year, what have you, the amount of emphasis on these are, are oftentimes from what I've seen and heard is, is almost tokenistic. And obviously that idea of systemic faithism plays into that is that, you know, what, if, what are the ways that we've constantly, you know, been uh, providing education to, to young people? And how are we going to adapt to the changing demographics in our schools? Um, and how are we going to sort of enrich the experiences of young people? Um, a wonderful, wonderful uh, educator out of the US, Diane Moore, uh, who's out of the Harvard uh, School, um, looking at religious literacy, a fantastic body of work that she's prepared that really talks about the importance of religious literacy in our schools. And there is is actually a tension, uh, as many of you may be aware of or will become aware of, between even acknowledging religion, even acknowledging it because of this idea that somehow um, our schools are secular. And, and the idea that the secularism means the, the, that erasure that Jillary talked about uh, was going to happen when it comes to religious adherence. And so someone actually just asked me in the chat about some, a term called cultural chauvinism, asking me, well, you know, what, what do you think of that term? That term speaks to when a, cult, a cultural group or someone belonging to a cultural group or religious affiliation sees themselves as superior to other cultural groups basically it's supremacy, whatever form that takes. We often talk about white supremacy, but there are other forms of, of that type of supremacy. The idea at, at its core is that we should in our education systems be looking towards creating environments in which religious background, eth ethnic background, race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, all of the various intersecting identities that people come to, uh, to their classroom with, all of that is celebrated, protected, um, shared, uh, learned about um, in a way that is, it is uh, welcoming and not judgmental in any way, shape or form. And that is reflected in the activities that are happening in the curriculum that is, that is uh, being delivered in the types of uh, content, video content, the programs that you know, people are, are sharing that, that we really have a full integration of the world out there into the classrooms in here. And I think that that is something that is simply not happening to the extent. In fact, me as an advocate, I often think of how confident am I raising these issues with my own children's teachers. And I will tell you, I have tried, but I myself have, have faced um, not necessarily aggression, but closed, you know, a closed response, not helpful not interested in providing me ideas of how I can contribute. Islamic Heritage Month, for instance, which happens every October, uh, you know, some schools, some boards celebrate it. We have the Toronto District School Board's excellent guide um, on, on the month with lots of ideas for uh, curriculum integrations. Some schools use it, some schools couldn't care less and won't integrate that type of that type of material, even if they have populations that include high numbers of Muslim students. And so again, it's that where do we turn to in the education system to talk about these issues even to raise awareness with our own um, student, our own children's teachers. Um, and, and just quickly on the issue of media, I would just want to say that um, I don't think any school board or school themselves want to be making it to the front pages of the Toronto Star or anyone else, anywhere else because of racism, anti-Black racism, Islamophobia, any other type of discrimination, that really there should be clear pathways to address any concerns that parents or students have in a way that's transparent and accountable. When there was a review of the York Region District School Board, one of the recommendations that we made uh, from the NCCM, which unfortunately was not implemented, that there, every school board in the province should provide a listing of the complaints that have been made uh, around discrimination in a transparent way without identifying people, obviously, but describing the situation and then providing accountability for how was that complaint handled. We need that type of transparency because when we've seen issues erupt at York or in Peel or elsewhere, oftentimes a common thread is that it was one family that was going through something not aware that many more families were suffering in silence and didn't know where to turn. And that community mobilization didn't necessarily coalesce when it needed to and a lot of young people suffered at a result and, and who knows what the long-term impacts 
of that is on them. So there's a lot of work to be done clearly. And I think the, the presence of so many people on this uh, webinar really point to that. Can I just add to that, um, Saima, if we have time? Um, I just, Ronaldo Walcott, who's a professor at OISE, talks about um, playing to emotion minus policy. And I'm reminded by that, of that, listening to Samia and Amira speak, because I think that often we get stuck in the continuum of train, uh, like on the continuum, just at the training part, we talk about it, we have religious holidays, and it just like can be some symbolic gestures of good faith, with, without backing it with the kind of type of policy that is required to actually make change and actually make clear to people what they can do when they do come up, up against um, something Islamophobic or racist or any other kind of form of oppression. And so for those of you who are at school boards and, or, um, you know, I, I think that really thinking about your sphere of influence is, is important. Think about how you can engage your board in, in how, in, you know, what does strengthening policy at the board level um, to ensure that families have the things that they need to hold members of the community accountable is important. Um, I'm also reminded of a, um, a quote that I read around truth and reconciliation by a former um, Cree chief. And he talks about the, the concept of justice or the word for justice in Cree. Um, and it's called, it's kintopatatin is the word for justice in Cree. And it says, you've been listened, it means you've been listened to, um, but it means you've been listened to by someone compassionate and fair and your needs will be taken seriously. And I think that's so beautiful because I think often we think, or people think, that they need to know the ins and outs of the Quran to defend a student's right to wear a hijab in school, for example, or need to know all of the kind of, you know, rules and regulations of Islam in order to really defend a student who um, has come to them and raise an issue. But no, whether you're talking about a Muslim student or a Black student or a queer student or somebody who lives at the intersections of all of that, what people want and what people need is that their educators and their school leaders are going to listen to them, are gonna take what they've come, come with seriously. They're gonna treat them with compassion. They're gonna come back and report back and have an open door policy. Those are the kinds of principles that I think um, we have to move forward with as we're working on these issues. That it's not just about you learning about what, you know, when and how people break their fast or when and how we celebrate Eid or um, why a young girl chooses to wear hijab at seven and another one doesn't wear one till 16 or doesn't wear one at all. What people need is that for when we raise issues to our teachers, to our principal, to the school board, that there's a confidence there that there that you will take it seriously, that you will will interact. And we've seen some really great um, kind of successes at the TDSB at the Human Rights Office. We recently put forward a new procedure that requires all principals to um, report and document in an online portal any incident of racism, bias, and hate. And what ha that has translated to is that we're actually now you know, in some cases forcing where it wasn't happening, but in, in all cases where we are having to have the conversation about what did, why, what did intervention not happen immediately? Why, um, and, and what are the tools that people need to be able to, um, to intervene and really understand how to make this whole for not only the student who was impacted or brought this forward, but for, you know, the entire classroom who has undoubtedly been, been impacted by the silence. So you make some really good points, like not only just the idea of, um, you know, when you're suffering, you feel like you're suffering in silos and, and how it would be such a wealth of information if we had kind of corroborated information about how widespread this is and how it manifests, but also for those who are those who are called to respond. Like, I think a lot of the time, because we don't share these stories, we try to hush them away for fear of whatever it is. Uh, we don't have a sharing of best practices. And let's just be honest, if we've operated in systems where we've been socialized, where the best action is to shush it up and not to deal with it, we're often ill-equipped with how to deal with it versus if we had open sharing and we thought, you know, let's just be honest. Yeah, we have issues. we got to solve these together and we need collective efforts on this. And yes, it's embarrassing that it's happened, but how do we move on? How do you do better once you know better? That would benefit everybody, right? Not just communities. And now, given that we have a number of educators here, um, Omar, I'm just wondering if, um, as we draw to a close, if you could per perhaps share some supports and resources that our educators here might be able to uh, utilize to make classroom spaces more inclusive so that we don't get to this point of heightened tensions. For sure, thank you. Um, just to maybe reiterate some of what has already been mentioned here, is that when we talk about that concept of humanizing Muslim students, it really is important to begin by recognizing the fact that they are Muslim, recognizing the faith identity of our students. 
um, to recognize their, individual, their individuality in terms of how they approach that faith-based identity as well. Um, to recognize that there are issues within um, forming that identity as a continuing journey through life and through their K to 12 years, really. And the families are very much part of that growth and development. To keep in mind that when these students go home and they turn on the news and they hear stories about Muslims or Islam, it's oftentimes ne negatively tainted. Um, to keep in mind that when the word terrorist or terrorism is used, what's the first image that comes to our minds? Think about it yourself right now. If you Google the word terrorist, what, what, what kind of images can you imagine you'll see? You can Google it yourself and you'll see. So kids face that reality on a, on a, on a regular basis. In terms of um, humanizing them, I think that's what I would suggest, a few things to consider. Ramadan is a big thing. We've mentioned it a couple of times in, the, in, in, this, in this panel here today. Ramadan is a, it's a full 30 days where anybody who identifies themselves as Muslim, whether they're practicing or not, partakes in some shape or form or way of celebrating this month. It's a, it's a month, not just a fasting, but a month, not even a spirituality, a month of identity building, identity forming, and, and so on and so forth. And, and the community does come together. Being aware that students in our, in, in our systems families in our system celebrate this month going when it is and trying to and, and reach out to that community, creating spaces and opportunities for communities to come into our schools, into our boards to support that identity and to share that identity and perhaps use not just October, Islamic Heritage Month, but also Ramadan, which comes up every year as a, as, as a platform by which to share this faith identity to help not only Muslim students, but non-Muslim students as well. When I first started, I talked about, trauma, about direct and indirect trauma. Non-Muslim students are indirectly affected when their Muslim friends are directly impacted by the trauma of Islamophobia, right? They face that. Growing up in, in, a, in a part of Toronto, when I was school in a part of Toronto where if my friend was Jewish and he had experienced anti-Semitic uh, behavior towards him, I felt it indirectly. I was defending him. I was the one, well, I think you kind of joined friends with me because I'm a bit bigger than most people at the time, but <laughs> the point is that, you know, that, that's indirect trauma, being aware that that exists. And so supporting, and as, as was mentioned, finding how many Muslim identifying students you have in your board and, or in your school or in your community around you and, and making sure that you create spaces and opportunities for them to develop and to become part of the human experience within our school systems. Uh, being aware of making sure that, that the dates for major events do not coincide with a, you know, significant days, days of significance, whether they're for any faith for that matter. I recall that just a couple of years ago, OFSA, which is the Ontario Athletic Association, decided to po uh, host a major, I believe it was a rugby event on the same day as Eid, preventing a number of Muslim girls from actually uh, participating in that event. Uh, recognizing the various identities that we've kind of highlighted here throughout, that you can be Black and Muslim, Indigenous and Muslim, LGBTQ and Muslim, or sorry, queer and Muslim. You can be rich and poor and be Muslim. You can be white and you can be Muslim. You can be Canadian. East Asian, there are so many different intersections of identities between faith and culture and other identities as well. Uh, humanizing Muslims by, reckon, by learning how to pronounce their names so that Muhammad does not become Mo or Ed and Fahad does not become Fred. Or in my case, Omar Z doesn't become just Oms or Oz because people can't just say Omar. You know, it, it's kind of interesting growing up that way. I didn't mind being called Oms as you know, science, anybody here a science teacher, right? It's not a bad thing. B equals I R. Okay, anyway, I digress. Um, but learning how to phonetically spell their, you know, pronounce their names. If we can pronounce all those hockey player names that I'm sure we can pronounce, that, that are Russian and Ukrainian and so on, I'm sure we can make the efforts to phonetically learn how to pronounce um, Muslim names and other names of other cultures as well. Humanizing Muslims by recognizing the mental health impact that happens on Muslims and, and uh, Muslim students and their families. And again, indirect trauma from people who are kids and family and staff and communities that are friends with Muslims. And perhaps you have a, a, an Islamic cultural center or worship center in your community, making that connection with them and, and, and getting support from that community as well to again, further humanize the experience that Muslim students are experiencing with anti-Muslim hate and Islamophobia. Helping to change the narrative and stereotypes around Muslims and the Muslim identity. Uh, role models. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about careers that we have in our in, 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 in our in our classrooms and in, in, in our uh, boards of education, showing how Muslims have contributed, how people who are Muslim identifying scientists have contributed to the world of education, uh, the, the, the world of science and math, algebra and alchemy didn't just come out of nowhere. There were contributions from Muslim identifying scientists uh, and engineers and mathematicians in the, in the past and even presently. You might be you know, shocked to learn that a, a Pakistani identifying Muslim identifying scientist in Calgary, you can look this up, he's Canadian, 
has come up with a technology to take neural, new, the, the neurological pathways, the brain, and put it to a microchip, right? So everybody watched Star Trek before, the first step has already happened by Muslim identifying Canadian here in Calgary. He gave a talk just two weeks ago, right? That's kind of a neat thing to bring into our classrooms and, and make, help us become more aware of those. 1001inventions.com is a great resource to show you know, where a lot of the contributions have come from. You might you know, ask yourself the question, who invented the guitar? Who really invented the guitar? You might be interested to look at 1001inventions.com. Anyway, if you're looking for more specific resources, the MINO, Muslim Educators Network of Ontario has a website, MuslimEducatorsOntario.org, MuslimEducatorsOntario.org. Uh, I'll try to put it in the chat if I can. And then we have a resources page on that website, which has uh, some resources specific to classroom plans, lesson plans, the inventions, that, 1001 inventions I just mentioned, uh, resources for supporting what happened on January 29, 2017 in our nation that was destructive to our, our, our unity of our, of our country, web resources on Islamophobia, um, the, you know, connection to the Green Square, Green Square campaign, which is in commemoration and memory of what happened on January 17th, uh, sorry, January 29, 2017. And then also a fairly new resource called Islamophobia Is, which is a video resource. Uh, video resource, which you can definitely use in your classroom, is ready to use. It's very um, applicable to what's happening right now and today. It's a brand new resource that was just released last, last month in February. So thank you for letting me share all of that. I, forgive me, I, I do talk very fast. I apologize. <laughs> No, no, thank you. Thank you. No apologies. Everybody keeps apologizing. And it just says that there's just so much that we want to keep talking about. And I, I was, I texted, private texted video over here. And I said, I think we need a part two, um, because there's just so much more that is left to explore. Thank you so much, um, everybody for your sharing. There's lots of different things that we need to take away in terms of the practical resources. Thank you so much. The tips and how it is that we empower communities. Um, the need to speak up if we're a member of the community, whether we're an ally of the community or, or we have identities um, within communities. Um, you know, it's really important the Ontario Human Rights was brought up and I'd like to remind all of us here that uh, the impact, the Ontario Human Rights looks at the impact of actions. They don't look at intentions. Um, they look at the impact and that's how they, what they use to measure uh, whether there has been incidences of, of harm, hurt and harm and hate it's the impact that's really critical. So this excuse of that wasn't the person's intention, it doesn't actually hold weight. Um, and that's something that we really need to be very careful of. Um, you know, at, at this day and age, uh, given, especially if you're in a GTHA school board, if you're continuing to um, claim ignorance, I mean, it's, it can't be by unconscious bias. You know, sometimes we say, oh, it was unconscious. It can't be unconscious at this point. That's willful ignorance. You're choosing to not engage. And it's interesting to me that we talk a lot of time at, um, in OC, uh, Ontario College of Teachers, is being lifelong learners. And, you know, I had a realization the other day, and I thought to myself, who is that lifelong learning meant for? Is it meant for us as educators um, to take AQ courses and get our qualifications up, or is it meant to be human literacy and that we're learning lifelong about the students and communities who we have the privilege um, to be serving and we have a charge to take care of and empower and look at them and build them up with uh, asset-based lenses not to fill them with deficit lenses and for them to doubt and feel shamed about their identities. So that lifelong learning piece, who is it for? Is it for us or is it for our students to learn you know, their place? Um, in society if they are living with um, those oppressions. And these are things to take away from. Um, I will turn it over to Vidya because Vidya is probably like, okay, Saima. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to everybody and thank you so much for joining all of you today. Uh, thank you for joining us and over to you, Vidya. Oh, thank you, Saima. And thank you to this wonderful, wonderful panel. I just want to, I just want to, um, oops, I just want to share screen one more time so you have a sense of uh, names, you can follow people, you can uh, get a sense of who everyone is. Um, but I think it's just important um, that we take a moment and really acknowledge the, the expertise, the time, the dedication uh, of, uh, of Amira, of Jillery, of Omar, of Samia in today's discussion. It was really such important moving forward, ongoing ongoing conversations that need to happen and absolutely a part two needs to happen. Uh, I'm getting a lot of positive feedback about a part two. We wanted to share with you that um, today's discussion will be available uh, in, in a recorded form. And the way that we'll communicate that with you uh, um, is through Twitter. 
uh, and it is the uh, Center for Feminist Research will post the recording, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, and that's CFR, uh, at CFR underscore, oh, I'm gonna get this wrong. Tiffany, if you could just go ahead and put the, put the Twitter handle in, um, in the chat, that would be wonderful. And Saima and I will be sure to repost that. Uh, so if you're following one of us, we will tag everybody and, and, and share that recording for all of you. Uh, we also wanted to really thank folks who attended today. Um, these, you know, it is close to dinner time for many people and you have taken your time out to be with us today, to be in this important conversation about what this means. And, you know, the questions that have come into me and the questions that have come into the pa panelists, it's so clear that we are, we are asking about what needs to happen at so many levels, at the level of the individual, the human experiences, uh, of Muslim students at school. The questions coming in are asking about the institutional level in terms of hiring and promoting Muslim uh, leaders in school boards and that being a priority. Um, and other leaders that have, that understand the ways that Islamophobia and intersecting identities play out, promoting those leaders. And also questions coming in around curriculum and what it means. And so I wanna really thank the panelists today for speaking in such broad ways about what that looks like, um, including parents and communities and partners um, outside of education that directly impact what's happening inside education. And so just before we close today, we do wanna share with you that we have another event coming up in the series. And this event uh, is happening on April 1st um, from 2.30 to 4.30. Uh, and more information will be coming out about that. Again, we'll, we'll make that available on the CFR uh, Twitter Twitter handle and Simon and I will will both uh, retweet that as well. But just to give you a little bit of sense of what that's going to be about, um, following the deep discussions from last year's 2019 Spotlight series on anti-blackness, Islam, and Islamophobia, the 2020 webinar draws upon the perspectives of community-engaged writers, scholars, and activists to explore and give voice to the personal, institutional, and community experiences of Islamophobia and anti-Blackness. So the speakers will address the ways in which Muslim communities of color are responding to issues of racialization, profiling, and systemic discrimination in different local, national, and international contexts, and how they and other Muslims of color are working to shape new narratives with uh, communities impacted by Islamophobia and anti-Blackness, and mitigating the impacts of these harmful discourses and enactments. So again, that's happening April 1st from 2.30 to 4.30. Um, we have speakers Naima Robert uh, and Mohamed Duwali, and co-moderators co Zulfakar Hirji and Nadia Ali. And so we hope to see you for that event as well. And again, a huge thank you to all of you who are here today to our panelists. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Uh, and we wish you all a wonderful evening and the rest of your week. And I'm just gonna quickly check my chat to make sure I'm not, I'm not missing anything. Sama, please feel free to jump in if I am. I just wanted to, uh, just getting some questions about distribution. So again, we will be tweeting it out through the CFR website and then Vidi and I will also retweet. And uh, there are some questions over here about perhaps if uh, the, those who've registered might be able to get a follow-up email with the next event in the series. And so we, I've, I've said that we will put these suggestions forward to CFR and uh, see if they can help us out. Wonderful, wonderful. So thank you all so much again for being here with us today and we wish you all the very best. Hope to see you soon.